Hello to all of my wonderful friends there in California and to all of those who are watching this from around the world online and are tuned in. This is the last evening and I think I'm the last speaker, uh, which I feel honored to be given th th that privilege. Now, this talk that I've been asked to do tonight follows on from what I did yesterday or last night. We've been asking and really in pushing the boundaries on the historical critique of Islam. And we looked at the Quran yesterday. We asked about the Quran in the 7th century, and then we moved into the 8th century, and we looked at the Kira'at problem, this problem here, all these different Qurans, 30 different ones that have been found now by Hatun. It's not that she found them or she discovered them. They've always existed. They've existed for a thousand years, but she was the one that made them public. And of course, shot that all over the world when we opened it up and, and showed them to the world back in 2016. And I said last night that we pretty much took out the Quran historically, and we took out this notion that it's been preserved perfectly. That we took out and shut down yesterday. Today now, we're going to look at another area. There are three major areas in the historical critique, the book, the man, and the place. The book would be the Quran, the man would be Muhammad, and the place would be Mecca. And so today we're taking on that third column or that third foundational pillar, the city of Mecca. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into the PowerPoint. Let's go through it. I'm going to try to do this in 40 minutes. That's all I've been given, but it may take a little longer. So let's open it up and let's get started. Now I'm calling it Jerusalem to Mecca. You will see why, because I used to be Petra to Mecca. But actually, we're finding out some new material. This is the beauty of this kind of research. You keep on coming up with new material. You keep on coming up with new research, new findings. And as we've always said, the more we scratch, the more we find. The more we find, the more we shine. The more we shine, the more they whine, oh, how sublime. And, and, and I think this is the case with Islam. No one's really scratched this material before. No one's really asked these kind of questions. And so I have all these researchers who have now come on board with me, and they are now starting to dig up all kinds of artifacts and showing that really don't just go to Petra, head on even further back to Jerusalem itself. Because much of what we know about Mecca, much of what we know about the practices, you're going to see that in this talk, much of what we know now about Islam it really began with the Jews in Jerusalem and then made its way to Petra in Jordan and then finally all the way down south to Mecca in what is today Saudi Arabia. So that's why I called it Jerusalem to Mecca. And you'll pick up on that thing as we go through. And there'll be five areas that I'm going to look at. The Muslims claims about Mecca, the historical problems with Mecca, the geographical difficulties with Mecca, Mecca's historical claims debunked, and then also the putting it all together, trying to make sense of everything we know about Mecca. And that's where we'll try to come to some kind of conclusions. <clears throat> Those final conclusions will hopefully we will be able to support. But again, much of what I'm giving you is what we call green papers. This is all original research, so it will keep changing. This is now September 2021. When we get to those final conclusions, I will remind you of that just because I, this may change with all the new research and all the new stuff that we're uncovering. So let's talk about first the claims that the Muslims make. And it doesn't really matter whether they're radical, nominal, probably not the liberals, but certainly those on the right in the middle, certainly 99% of Muslims would make these claims. They would say that for the last 1400 years, Muhammad has been the last and greatest prophet, final one as well. The Quran was his revelation sent down only to him. Uh, Mecca was his city to begin with, where he was born in 570 and where he moved from in 622. Uh, considered by Muslims as the oldest city in history. That means it's where Adam and Eve were thrown down to. And therefore, Islam is the final religion based on Muhammad's life and sayings, the Sunnah, and on the Quran's teaching itself. Now, conclusion, obviously, from what you've just seen there, Islam is completely dependent on those three pillars, the book, the man, and the place, the Quran, Muhammad, and Mecca. So why not investigate both the Quran, which we did yesterday, Muhammad, which we've already done before, and we'll do it again, and then Mecca today to see if indeed the Muslims are correct. But let's begin with just how important Mecca really is. 
in this is is important according to the standard islamic narrative so this is what muslims tell you and what they tell me this is why they consider mecca important this is what they claim it is the oldest and best known city in history they would say that Mecca is where Adam and Eve were thrown down to from the Garden of Eden. That's in chapter 7, verse 24. Not the word Mecca, not the name Mecca. They were thrown down to earth. Their traditions are the ones that specify that it was the city of Mecca. Mecca is where Abraham lived when he destroyed the idols within the Kaaba. Again, that's in chapter 21, verse 51 to 7. Not the name Mecca. That word doesn't exist in that chapter at all. That is implied because he's there in the Kaaba. And the Kaaba, as we know, according to all the traditions, was in Mecca. So the traditions impose the idea that Abraham lived in Mecca. Mecca is the center of trade, north, south, east, and west. And we're going to confront that because uh, especially Montgomery Watt's trade theory on why it was important. So it stands to reason if it is one of the best known and best documented places in history, someone should know about it, right? When you look at the Quran itself, Mecca is the center of Islam and the center of history. No, Everything I'm showing below now does not contain the word Mecca for one very good reason. The word Mecca itself in the Quran is only found in chapter 48, verse 24. It's only found one time, which is odd if it's such a great city, if it has this much important, if it's been around from the very beginning. Why is it there's only one reference to it? What we do know in chapter 3, verse 96, that it's the first sanctuary appointed to mankind. Bukka, it says, could is that Mecca? Who knows? It's the mother of all settlements, according to chapter 6, verse 92, chapter 42, verse 7, where the prophet came from. It doesn't say the word Mecca. We've already talked about Adam and Eve and Abraham living there. It is where Muhammad was born in supposedly uh, from 570 up until 622. It became the center of the Qibla, the direction of prayer in 624, according to chapter 2, verse 149 to 50. So this implies that people were living there from the very beginning. Ironically, though, it was only referred to once in the Quran. When you look at Mecca, you also need to look at the vegetation that is shut, that is referred to. There. Lots of vegetation in this city, which implies water. If there's vegetation, you have to have water. Now, according to the Quran and the traditions, Mecca is referred to as the place of the prophet. As I said, it doesn't say Mecca. It just says where the prophet lived. He lived in a valley, and also there was a parallel valley, according to Ibn Isham and al-Buhari. Also, it has a stream. A stream carries water, so there has to be lots of water there in Mecca, according to al-Buhari. It's outside its ruins is this pillar of salt, referring to the wife of Lot, who turned into a pillar of salt, according to Surah 37. It has fields, according to al-Buhari, again, needing water. It has trees, according to Sahih al-Tarmidi. Grass, al-Buhari says that. He also says it has fruit. Al-Tabari talks about clay and loam. And also Surah 6 and then all 16 in Surah 80 all talk about olive tree. So all of these things, field, field, trees, grass, fruit, olive trees, all require water. One of the ironies about the olive trees, we don't know of any olive trees that early that existed in Arabia at all. All the olive trees that existed anywhere in the world were always way up in the Mediterranean. That's 600 miles further north. According to Ibn Hisham, there are mountains overlooking the Kaaba. If the Kaaba is in Mecca, then that means there should be mountains there. Yet Mecca is not in the valley and has none of these listed above because it is in a desert. So it's just too arid and dry to support any of these things that are underlined there that you see on the screen. Mecca is the burial place of many of the biblical prophets. This was a surprise to me, and this we've just found out in the, just the last year. Take a look at what they claim according to their traditions. Reuben Wheeler, quoting some traditions, say that when Adam died, he was buried in Mount Abu Qubais, near Mecca, where Eve had to also have been buried. His head is at the site of the Kaaba, and his feet stretched out. Now, take a look at this map I've just put up here. This is something I've just found out in the last few weeks. Note where the ancient Abu Kubais is. See, there is a Kubais, Mount Kubais there in, or Kubais, as you wait for how you want to pronounce it, in near Mecca. But the original Mount Kubais is way up near Latakia, just off the western or the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, way up in Syria. Look where the green arrow is. There it is. That's in northern Syria. <laughs> it's almost 1,200 miles north of Mecca. Possibly an example, we're going to get into a lot of these later on, not this talk, about this borrowing from the north. All these names and places and dates, we're going to talk about some of it later on when we look at the five stages of the Hajj. But there's that mountain Kubais. That's the ancient mountain Kubais, which now one, the one near Mecca has been renamed after. Seth, 
supposedly was buried where Adam and Eve were buried. Well, they were buried in Mecca. Ishmael was also buried near the Kaaba. Uh, tomb his, his tomb is there and right next to the Kaaba, right next to the black stone. Noah, of all people, I had no idea. He's been reburied next to Adam in Mecca. So here you have Hud, the great, great grandson of Noah. According to Surah 11, it talks about him. He is also buried in Mecca. Sah, the grandfather of Hagar from Medina, died in Mecca. Where you die, you are buried. Prophets are always buried where they die. The Queen of Sheba from way down south looks like she was also buried in Mecca. Daniel, from the book of Daniel, he was also buried in Mecca. In fact, when you look at the traditions, according to Reuben, there are anywhere from 70 to 300 prophets buried in Mecca. If you look at the traditions, they include, as I already mentioned, Hud, Saleh, Ishmael, Noah, Shu'aib, and I'm coming on down others like, like, well, there's 300 of them, so I'm not even going to try to try to list them, but they're all buried there in Mecca. Boy, that must be a great burial place with so many of them. Well, that's got to mention that even as they're buried, if you were to uncover them, they're still praying in their graves. The earth does not consume their bodies. No matter how long a time passes, their bodies remain preserved from decay. So if we were to go to Mecca today and start digging down there where the Kaaba is or just its environs around, in fact, that's what's being done as we speak. You can see all of the cranes that are all around the Kaaba where they're building all these skyscrapers. Are they coming across these these? Prophets that are buried, almost 300 of them. I've not heard any word about it, but it looks like, according to traditions, that's where they're buried, and that's what happens to them. So let's just remind yourself, Adam and Eve, Seth, Ishmael, Noah, Hud, Saleh, Queen of Sheba, Daniel, 70 to 300 of the prophets are all buried there in Mecca. This would mean that almost all of the Bible will have to be rewritten and all of the stories be redirected 600 miles further south, if this is true. Yet there is so much evidence for, for, the, uh, for the biblical narrative historically, yet almost nothing for Islam. Now, what exactly uh, problem or historical problems do we have with Mecca? There are so many, I don't even know where to begin, but let's start with the sources. The sources is probably the first thing you need to talk about. And this is one thing that really hit me way back in the 1990s when I came across it and I was told about it. Now, okay, Islam's emergent, according to Islamic tradition, according to standard Islamic narrative is this. Muhammad was born in 570. He started receiving revelations in 610. He went up to, from Mecca up to Jerusalem and went up to the seven heavens called the Miraj in 621. He then moved up to Medina in 622. Uh, Mecca was then conquered by him in 630, and then he dies in 632, and that's his life. That's what the standard Islamic narrative has been telling us. Abu Bakr then takes over, and then he dies in 634, so he only lasts two years. Umar then takes over, and he lasts, well, he lasts 10 years because he dies in 644. Therefore, Uthman comes to power. In fact, Umar is killed, and so Umar, Uthman takes over, and he lasts, well, uh, he, he lasts 12 years. And while he's uh, on the throne, the Quran is compiled a second time. He is killed and Ali takes over. And Ali lasts only five years and he is killed. So that's the standard Islamic narrative of how Islam began. And all of this was taking place in and around Mecca and Medina. Now, here's the difficulty. Everything I've just said, all of that comes from where? Well, it comes from the standard Islamic narrative, the Islamic traditions. So when were they written? Hopefully, and I assume that they would have been written at the time that this was all taking place by people who were actually there, eyewitness to the events. But the answer is no, absolutely not. Muhammad dies in 632, and that's when you would have hoped that the standard Islamic narrative was written, in 632, at the time he died, by people who knew him, or at least lived where he lived. However, the Siddha, the biography of Muhammad, was first written down by a man named Ibn Ishaq in 765. But we have nothing of Ibn Ishaq. We have to go to this guy, Ibn Hisham, who died in 833. Muhammad died in 632. Do your maths. You can see there's a problem here. And since Ibn Hisham only takes what he likes of Ibn Ishaq and throws the rest away, we don't know if any of it comes from Ibn Ishaq. So let's just throw him away as well. The other biography that's famous is the one from Al-Wakiri, who died in 835. So this is the ninth century, folks. This is over 200 years after Muhammad. We get the first biography. But we also have the sayings, the hadith, which are first written down by Al-Buhari in 870, and then Sahih Muslim 875, Ibn Midi in 884, Ibn Majah in 887, Abu Dawood in 899, and uh, Masai in 915. So from 
870 up to 950s. That's the late 9th century going up into the 10th century. We have these six major compilations of the sayings of Muhammad. But take a look at how late they are. They all come after al-Buhari. Now we have about two genres, the tafsir, which are the commentaries, and the tahrik, which would be the histories of all mankind, written by al-Tabari in 923. That is the 10th century, folks. Are you starting to see a problem here? The earliest of the standard Islamic narratives that we're always quoting all the time doesn't even appear for 200 years after Muhammad's death. Now notice, I'm putting Abdul Malik there because he is the one that actually introduces Islam to us on the coins and on the Dome of the Rock and on the Caliphal Protocols. So let's start and put his line there. That's 140 years after him that we even hear about this Muhammad's life and what he said and what he did. So can you see that is a problem and yet nobody's talking about this. No one wants to put this on a timeline. You now see the timeline, show your Muslim friends this and say, you've got a problem because if that's the best source you've got, but hold on a minute. What about the Abbasids? They are the ones that really create the Muhammad we have today. And that's what we're finding out. The Muhammad of today is really the Muhammad of the Abbasids, and they come to power in 749. So it's the mid-8th century, which is over 100 years after Muhammad, that we finally get the Muhammad of today. I'm not going to get into that because we're not talking about Muhammad so much. We're talking about Mecca. But just to give you that, this is a real problem, folks, because the sources are just, just, just too late. Look at a map. Let's just show you what I'm talking about. Remember, Islamic tra tradition, all the standard Islamic narrative says that everything happens where those two, two green circles are, Mecca and Medina. That's what they tell us. That's what they tell us. That's the Hijaz, that area. Yet all the writers of the traditions worked in Baghdad, which is 1,800 kilometers to the north. Ibn Hisham, <coughs> who was the first to write the Siddha, is from Basra. But he wrote in Cairo. I'm sorry, he grew up in Cairo. Cairo is 1,600 kilometers away. Basra is 1,800 kilometers away. Al-Buhari, who writes us, who is the one who gives us the, the first of what we know as the Hadith, he is from Bukhara. That is in Uzbekistan. That is a good 4,200 kilometers away. That is far, far away, way off to the east. Then you have Al-Tabari. He is from Tabaristan, which is in Iran today, northern Iran. That's 2,800 kilometers away. None of the traditional writers, the standard Islamic narratives, lived or worked in Mecca or Medina. They were too far to the north of Mecca and came from west and east of Baghdad. Putting it, I mean, you need to see that all of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from. More than that, let's look at this map here. The problem with the northern hegemony. The Islamic traditions say everything happened here in Mecca, Medina, as I just said. However, all the writers in the traditions worked in Baghdad, which is 1,800 kilometers too far north. All of these northern areas are where the Abbasids originated from. Furthermore, all of the writers of the traditions, as I said earlier, worked in the 9th century. Look at that timeline at the bottom, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Conclusion, they all wrote their material hundreds of miles too far away. That's the map you see at the top there. And hundreds of years too late. There's the timeline at the bottom. So look at the map and look at the timeline. Look at the map and look at the timeline. Do you see it's too far north and too far distant? Too far north and too far distant. Remind your Muslim friends, you're, everything you're going to tell me about Muhammad, about Mecca, about the Quran is too far north and too far distant. And they make it into a jingo if you want to, because that is the problem with sources. Now, let's ask the same question of Christianity. Because do we have the same problem? Are all our writings, and they are the traditions of Jesus. If you look at the New Testament, it follows the same genre. Uh, you have the Siddha of Jesus, which would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the black letter part of that writing. You have the Hadith of Jesus, which would be the led, red letter editions, uh, red letter, the red letters, wherever Jesus is speaking, that would be uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John again. And then you have the Tafsir, which would be the commentaries, which would be Paul's letters. And then you have the Tahrik, which would be the histories, uh, of the early church. That's the book of Acts. So let's look at the New Testament. It really follows the same genre of as the traditions do. The Siddha, the, the, the Hadith, the Tafsir, and the Tahrih. So let's take a look and see where they were written and how long after Jesus' death were they written. Now, I'm going to be very, I'm going to step on a lot of people's toes. Listen, I know any of you who are watching, you're going to get angry with me because you're gonna not going to like the dates I'm giving. I'm giving the most liberal dates. I'm not giving the conservative dates. I'm giving the most liberal dates to show you even with the most liberal dates, you're going to be, I'm going to make my point. Okay. I'm going to show you how much better our material is on who Jesus is and when he wrote, I'm sorry, when he lived and what he said than what Islam has. So there, Jesus dies in 33 AD. 
The book of Acts, which is the Tahrik for us, uh, would have been written between 52 and 62 AD. That's 20 to 30 years later. Paul's letters would be the Tafsir, the commentaries that talk about what Jesus said and did, would have been written 48 to 65 AD. That's 15 to 34 years later. Mark uh, w- would be the beginning of the Sira in the Hadith. That would be the biography and the sayings of Jesus. He died in 70 AD, so that's 37 years later. Matthew and Luke, who also wrote the Sira in the Hadith, they died in 80 AD, so that's um, uh, for then 40 seven years later. And then John, the Gospel of John, would, would the last of the Siddha and the Hadith, he died in around 90 AD, so that's 57 years later. Look at that. That's the most liberal dates I could find. And now notice that they are all written by people within 29 to 57 years of Christ's death. The whole New Testament is written within 60 years of Christ's death, All of them, all of the writers, all of the New Testament writers lived in the same place Jesus lived. They didn't live hundreds of miles away, and they either knew him personally, like John and Matthew would have, or they got their material from others who did know him personally, and that's where Mark and Luke would have got their material from, or and heard what he said. That's why it's so important that we put this on a timeline. Com- do a comparison, we do not have the problems that Islam have. Our sources are within 60 years of Christ's death, written by those who actually were with him, were walking with him, and heard him speak and saw what he did in the last three years of his life. That's why our sor- we, no one really talks about our source like you have to with Islam. So for the scholars in the 21st century, there are a number of concerns concerning Islam, not Christianity, concerning Islam. Islam in Mecca, they say, as we know, did not exist in the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years. The Quran probably was well, not one man in 22 years, but likely evolved over a period of 50 to 100 years. Therefore, the conclusion, the history of Islam and certainly the city of Mecca, at least from the time of Caliph Abdul Malik and before, is a later fabrication. Their concern is this. Why did it take so long to write it all down? Why two to 300 years? Were these people just not literate? That's what Muslims tell me. Listen, hold on a minute. They controlled Basra, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, and also they went as far away into the West, all the way over to Spain, and as far away over here, all the way to Afghanistan. You can, are you telling me nobody in that area from Spain to Afghanistan could read and write? Of course they could. Look at those cities that they controlled. What about the ninth century biographers? Where did they get their material from? They only, they're talk, you're talking about two to 300 years later. And if it is two to 300 years later, can we trust it? Should we trust it? Shouldn't we go back to the 7th century, to go back to where Mecca, uh, that's all that, these events surrounding Mecca take place? Shouldn't we go back to the very century where Mecca existed? Let's do. And let's see what we're finding. No, we are only interested in the 7th and 8th century. I'm no longer interested in the 9th and 10th. Am I getting a broken record? Have you been hearing me say this? For a very good reason. Now, let's look at a map, because here's the map of what Islamic standard Islamic narrative tells us. It says uh, that Muhammad uh, lived in that brown area, and that by the time he died, that was the area that they controlled. By the time the, uh, the by the time Abu Bakr and Umar died, uh, they controlled the orange area. By the time that Uthman and Ali died, uh, they controlled all the pink and the orange and the brown area. And by the time, finally, when you get the Umayyad Caliphate, that controls all the way from, the, from India and in the east, all the way to Andalusia and West Africa and the West. But we're, no, we're interested mostly in just the, the brown, the orange, and the pink area, because that's the area we're, we're, we're talking about. That's the beginning of Islam. And we're looking at Mecca from that period, okay? Let's look in that period. Meccan Arabic is not Quranic. This is r- going to be troubling for anybody who believes that the Quran comes from Mecca, or the Quran comes from Medina, or that the Quran comes from Muhammad. Because the Quranic Arabic that you look, you can see on it, this is the green area that they that all the standard Islamic narrative and every Muslim, in fact, everybody I know says where the Quran comes from, that green rectangle there. That's the Hijaz. That's the area where Mecca Medina exists. But the Quran, Arabic, the Arabic in the Quran does not come from that area. It has grammatical structures that are different. And the, the grammatical structures all come from much further north around Jordan. The Irab, unstressed inflectional short final vowels are marked with dire critics, known as Irab, because they were characteristic of the Bedouin dialects. You have the Tarba Buta, which is the, the, the little the circle with the two dots above it, the Ta, to make it feminine at the end of the word. That did not exist in the Hijaz, but it did exist with the Nabataean Aramaic, which is much further north. The Aleph Maksur, it looks like an S shape. Uh, it's the Yah sound at the end of the word. 
or the I sound that comes at the end of words. That did, does not exist in any uh, any Arabic that came from the Hijaz, that, but it does is just Nabataean Aramaic. The definite article, the L, introduces a phonic coronal consonant. That comes from Nabataean Aramaic. The Sabaic Arabic, which is way down south, where that big, you can see the big red uh, square is, that's the Arabic that existed in the Hijaz. It originated from Yemen and made its way up north, up to Mecca and Medina. Well, not Mecca, but to Medina. Around 600 BC is where it was created. Yet it contained vowels and consonants needed for the Quran. The Quran didn't have vowels and, vowels and consonants. Look at the earliest manuscript. There are no vowels and consonants on the earliest manuscripts. Conclusion, <coughs> the chronic Arabic, Nabataean Aramaic, existed 600 miles further north, while the 7th century Arabic of Mecca in the Hejaz was Sabaic. And it would have accommodated the text of the Quran had it been used, eradicating the Kidat problems later on. So this would have not have been a problem if they had used Sabaic Arabic from the Hijaz, which would have existed at the place if Muhammad was living in Mecca, if Mecca did exist. As you're going to see, we're going to have a the Muslims are going to have a problem persuading me and soon persuading you. Now, what's my remit tonight? We are no longer interested in the ninth and tenth century, as I said before. They are just too late, too far to a uh, way to be trusted. The traditions were all constructed by the Abbasids from 749 and on, and they definitely had an agenda, including the creation of the city of Mecca and eradicating anything from the Umayyad period that said to the other. So we're only interested in the 7th and 8th century um, of those artifacts and that which we can find from that period. Where it all began, that's where we need to be. Who are the main players we're going to look at? Well, the main players are the people who have actually I'm dependent on. And when you look at the main player, the primary revisionists who have really been attacking Mecca and Muhammad and the Quran are these here. And you notice most of them are either German or they are British. There's only one American amongst them. That's John Wandsborough. These are all people from Europe. They're way ahead of us, and they have done an amazing job, and I stand in awe of their work that they have done. I could go and unpack each one of them, but we don't have time. The ones who are now the new revintages, well, that's the new crop. We're the new ones who are coming out, and you can see who they are. Most of you know who they are. If you've been watching the internet, if you've been following, these are the ones that I work with. These are the ones that I have had most indebted to, and they're all on the team that's working with me, and I'm working with them. So thanks to all of them, and thanks to those who continue to take this work. So this is not me doing this work. I'm mostly the vocal man. I'm the one that's going out and actually making sense of it all and making communicated so you can all understand it. But let's start then with the geographical problems with Mecca. And as you're going to see, they're all in the wrong place, and they're all in the wrong time. The origins of Mecca, according to what I now know today, what I want to plan to do, we need to first go back in history prior to the 7th century to the periods leading up to the emergence of Islam. So let's begin with the land of Arabia, including the Hijaz, where Mecca is situated. This is where the standard Islamic narrative suggests it all began. Here's the problem. Look at the maps. So let's start with the maps. Now, we don't have any maps that are early. We have this one here, uh, but this is from 1482. But it's the map that was credited, that, that credits Ptolemy's references to Arabia. Ptolemy in the second century talked all about Arabia and he gave all these places. The problem was he never read, made a map because he didn't really travel there. He just knew all these places from all the work that he had done. So this man, Leonard Holle, Holle put this map together in 1480 to try to describe. But notice what's missing. Ptolemy never talked about a place called Mecca. It's nowhere on the map. Here's another map done in 1541 by Laurent Fries. And again, trying to recreate all of Arabia from Ptolemy's writings. And again, Mecca is missing. Here's another map from 1571 by Sebastian Munster out of Germany. And Mecca's missing again. Oh, dear. Didn't exist. Now, this is another map that has been written, uh, made today to go back and try to find out everything we know about the 7th century. So it's re going back to the 7th century for everything we would have known at that time. And notice Mecca is even missing on that map. Here's another one. A 7th century Mac, map, supposedly, again, Mecca's missing, just doesn't exist. It should be wherever that little question mark is, the red question mark. The 7th century Qiblas also were not, were not were missing. So everything we've seen about the map show that there was no Mecca. Now let's go to the Qiblas. This is Dan Gibson's work. He's done an amazing job uh, from 1989 up until to, uh, 
2005, I think it is, is where he did his greatest work, but he's still working as we speak. He's not stopping. And what he found by going to all the kibbas, all the mosques there in the 7th and 8th century, he noticed that all the mosques up until 706 were all uniquely facing Petra in Jordan, 600 miles further north. The kiblas is the direction of the mosque where they all have to pray. They were all facing where you can see all those lines are from as far away as Guangzhou in China, in Sherman, in Kerala, in India, the Sana, up in the Tarakana, Bibi Samarkand in Uzbekistan. They were all facing Petra uniquely up to 706. Then in 706, some in between mosques start to show. They're not pointing to any specific place. Halfway between Petra and Mecca, right in the middle of a sand, there's nothing there. There's no mountain, no stream, no village, no town, nothing. Just desert. But they're there for a reason. So that's why we're going to have to find out what were they doing. And from 706 to 772, you have these in-between mosques. Then finally, you get the Meccan Qibla. And that is first introduced in 727. Remember, Muhammad died in 632. The Qibla was canonized according to the Quran. What if you believe the Quran is correct from 624 on? So every mosque from 624 should be facing Mecca. They don't begin to face Mecca until 727, over 100 years later. And then it's not till 876 that all the mosques then face Mecca. We get another group of mosques that's coming out of North Africa and also Andalusia or Spain today that are facing parallel between the line that goes between Petra and Mecca. What in the world is going on? They start to appear in 732. That's a good hundred years after Muhammad. Why? You're going to see why. This has to do with a political statement, but hold on. So all the kibbles were facing towards Petra up until 706. There was confusion for the next hundred or more years. 17 were facing Petra, 8 are being between, 10 were facing Mecca, 6 are parallel. And the Qibla was therefore not finalized towards Mecca until 876. That's 250 years just too late. You've got a problem with Mecca. Which are the most accurate Qiblas? Because this is what they've been saying. It's just the people beforehand didn't know how to, their direction. That's why they were all off. And that's what David King says. Yet Petra, if you look at the 17 that have been found towards Petra, they're 2.9 degrees of accuracy. The best is the between ones, they're 0.98% of accuracy. Parallels are 3.5 degree of accuracy. In fact, it, the Meccan pig kiblas are by far the worst, 4.78 degrees of accuracy. So you cannot use that argument. The earlier kiblas were much more accurate than the ones facing Mecca. So that can no longer be used as an argument. What about the land route? And this is, <clears throat> boy. If Mecca was an important city, it had to be on the trade route. And this is what all the Muslims tell us, that it is on the trade route. The standard Islamic narrative said it controlled the trade route, north, south, east, and west. So Montgomery Wack helped them with this. In the last century, he wrote a great book and he did some studies and he said, well, listen, the reason of why Mecca became important because it's really not anywhere where there should be trade going through it. Looking on a map, you can see there, it's kind of, off the beaten track. So he said, this is how you solve it. And this is what he said. All the trade coming from China and India could not go over the, the, uh, the Hindu Kush or the Himalaya mountains. So they had to come from the Western coast of India and they went up across the Arabian Sea or through the, the Persian Gulf up to uh, what is today Basra. And then from there, it would boom, go right across Iraq and Syria over to the Mediterranean. That's the trade route. <clears throat> and that was the case up until the 5th century. But in the 5th century, there were two great empires, the Sassanian Empire, which are Persian, and the Byzantine, which were Christian. Uh, these two empires, the Persian, so Rashtun Empire, start warring with each other. And as they were warring with each other, they shut down that trade going to the Persian Gulf. So boom, that got shut down. Montgomery Wash comes to, well, what comes to the, uh, he comes to the rescue and says, well, not a problem, not a problem. Because it got shut down the Persian Gulf, they had to redirect the trade. And so what they did, they came across the Arabian Sea, there to Aden. And from Aden, they went zip right up the western coastal plateau through Mecca up to Gaza in the north. So that was known as the trade route theory. I remember hearing it. I remember studying it. And I never thought anything about it. I thought this was true. And then Patricia Corona, who reads and writes 15 languages, came in 19. 77, and then specifically uh, 10 years later in 1987, she said, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Let's take a look at Arabia again, a little bit more specific. She said, are you telling me that they would take the goods off here 
at Aden, and then they would go up to Taif there, where I've just shown, and they would then take from get off the plateau and come back down to Mecca, which is their town about a thousand meters off the western plateau, and then they would go back up the western plateau to get to Yathrib, and from there they would head on up to Gaza. Notice there's a detour there. That doesn't make sense, especially why would you get off the western plateau, come down a thousand meters when there's no water there? It's a desert. There's no vegetation. If there's no water, there's no vegetation. If there's no vegetation, there's no town. If there's no towns, there's no people. If there's no people, there's no trade. And so that would not make sense, she said. So she decided to go back and find out what really happened. Now, remember, this woman region writes 15 languages, so she could go back and find everything about all the languages. And this is what she found. She debunked Montgomery Watt by saying, no, no, no. The trade did come across the Arabian Sea. That's not in doubt. It may have stopped in Aden to get provisions, true, but it didn't go, they didn't transship, take things off because it would have been too expensive to go across the land. When you have a waterway going right up the Red Sea, there's the Red Sea. You keep the goods on board the ship. That's what we do today. That's why you have all these tankers all over the world, taking goods from all over the world, because it's the cheapest way to tend good, because all you need is wind to push your sails. And that's why they went right up there uh, from Aden. They went right up to Agilis. Agilis is where they stopped. That's on the western coast in, in Eritrea. And then from Agilis, they went up the Red Sea, up then to Petra, <coughs> up the Gulf of Aqaba, and then from Petra to Gaza, and then from Gaza, they went boom, all over the Mediterranean world. So that was the new trade that she found by looking at the documents. You need to look at the documents. Don't look and suppose, suppose it. Find out what history tells us. And she just completely debunked Montgomery Watt. But hold on a minute. We've just learned something new in the last few months, in the last six months, what Patricia Crone didn't even know. Because she assumed, therefore, after it went from Agilis and went right up the Red Sea, and therefore Mecca could, or certainly the, along the coast, it could have been part of the truth, but she didn't go far enough. And we have discovered something, that is the Red Sea trade never went through Arabia at all. Because people are still saying, well, it went through Jeddah. Jeddah is a city that was created on the coast so that it could service Mecca. It's very close to Mecca, only about half an hour away by car today. Mecca was up in the desert, but Jeddah was on the coast. And therefore, Jeddah was a city that they went to after Agilis. But no one bothered to look at a map. Now, according to the Islamic traditional view, according to the standard Islamic narrative, this is what they say. Yathrib was serviced by Yanbu, Mecca was serviced by Jeddah. So therefore, Jeddah was the town that all the trade went through. Trade was not only by land, it was also by sea. Through the Red Sea, via Jeddah and Yanbu, following the Arabian coast. That's what the standard Islamic narrative tells us. You can see it on the map. That's what all Muslims tell us. That's what everybody's, even Patricia Crone said that much. Alexander the Great, in fact, in 328, he also went to Mecca via Jeddah, according to the Islamic traditions. Why? He used Jeddah to get to Mecca. And he sent three expeditions to Arabia. The first one was to Bahrain. There you can see it on the map. Didn't get very far. The second one didn't get too much farther. Just went, got as far as the Gulf of Oman. But then the third one went around Arabia. He was trying to find a sea route to get to Egypt so he could attack Egypt from the sea and not by land. Problem was, that did go up the Red Sea, but it, then it came right back down again because there were no supplies. They, they couldn't find any supplies for their troops in the Red Sea. They could not go there, <coughs> possibly because they were going on the wrong coast. No place for supplies on the Arabian Desert. Why? Here's why. And this is something brand new that we've just found in the last few months. They were going up the wrong coast of the Red Sea. <laughs> To understand the problem, you need to use a topographical map to see the waterways of the Red Sea. This has been provided me by a guy named Chiaro Zazaro in 2013. He came up with this and showed this, and I'm so happy for him. Take a look at this topographical map, looking from space down onto the Red Sea. And you notice that blue channel there. Can you see it there right in the middle? Here, let me put it. I'll put a red line over it. There's the blue channel. The blue is the deep water channel, and that's where all our large ships today, that's, they go right up that channel. They need it because they're so huge. 
But back in the seventh century and earlier, there was no huge ships like that. They used much smaller ships. So they use these shallower water channels, which are right there. Those are the shallower water channels. So that it's for smaller ships to accommodate them. Those all went up the Western coast. They, unlike the East Arabian shore, which was arid, had no water, but no fresh water, and thus few people, the West African shore had plenty of fresh water. Why? Well, where? And plenty of people. And the reason why is where there's water, there is vegetation. Where there's vegetation, there are people. Where there are people, there are towns. Where there are towns, there are cities. Where there are cities, there is civilization. Where there's civilization, there is history. The East Coast had no history because it had no water, therefore no vegetation, therefore no people, no towns, no places, no history, because there was no civilization. The West Coast had everything, and that's why all the shallower water channels are on the west side of the Red Sea. And we know the names of where the ports were. This is what's interesting. Take a look and see where the ports are. Let me just put this map up here and show you where they are. Well, there were five ports, five coastal cities on the western coast of the Red Sea. Asab in Eritrea from 246 BC. Agilis, uh, also from Eritrea in 79 today. I'm saying Eritrea today. These are modern days. Uh, so you all know where I'm talking about. And then you have Swakin from Sudan. That's in 170 AD. Berenice uh, from what is today Egypt, 275 BC. And then the fifth one would be Safaga uh, there in Egypt, 282. Now notice those, look at the dates, 246 BC, 79 AD, 170 AD, 275 BC, 282 BC. These are when they, the first recorded records we have of trade in those five cities. Those all predate Islam quite noticeably. And more than that, if you notice, you will also see that those five cities are equidistant for one day's ride by boat, proving that that's where all the trade was. They're all dates predate Islam, five days distance on the Red Sea. Only Yambu on the Arabian coast is known as a port city. What about Jeddah as a port for Mecca? Well, we have no history for either Jeddah or Mecca until the eighth century. Why? Because neither had water nor a large population enough to accommodate early trade. Brrr, let's get rid of them. So without Mecca, what then happens to Islam? Bingo. You put a red X over it. There is no Islam without Mecca on the trade route. Note what has happened since March 13th. A Wikipedia editor changed the wiki article on Jeddah on March 14th because of what we've been telling him. And now they have now taken Jeddah out of the picture on Wikipedia. Let's go to the five stages of the Hajj in Mecca, because this is another big problem. When you look at the five stages, the Kaaba in Mecca, well, there's also a Kaaba in Petra. Interestingly, there's also a Kaaba in Jerusalem. It's called the cube. It is, in fact, the Kaaba, the word Kaaba is the word for cube in Arabic, which is the same thing as the Holy of Holies that you find in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Dome of the Rock is today. Safa and Marwa in Mecca, you have these two mountains where Hagar went back and forth to find water. And so people go back and forth seven times from Safa to Marwa after they go around seven times around the Kaaba. Interestingly, why seven times around the Kaaba and why counterclockwise? Because the Jews did that around the, the uh, Holy of Holies there in Mount Moriah, where the Dome of the Rock is today. So they've just copied what was originally in Jerusalem. They then copied into Petra. Now it's there in Mecca. Same with Safa Marwa. Safa Marwa, seven times back and forth. But take a look at those pictures. Those are just rocks. They're only about 15 feet high. That is not a mountain. Those are nothing more than facsimiles of mountain. The real Safan Marwa are in Petra, but the real Safan Marwa were way back in Jerusalem. Safa and Marwa. Marwa is the Arabic for Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is where the temple stood. Mount the temple is where the Holy of Holies was. That is why it's now, it is still there today. Well, no, not the Holy of Holies, not the temple anymore. It is now the Dome of the Rock that has been placed there since 691. Across the Kidron Valley is what Mount Scopus. The name that was used in the, in the second century for Mount Scopus was Safa. So Marwa and Safa are Mount Moriah and Mount Scopus there in Jerusalem. They were then brought then to Petra, which are mountains, and then they were brought then to as little rocks there in Mecca. The hill of Ararat in Mecca is also found, that same hill is found in Petra. <coughs> the Jamarats in Mecca, the seven, the three places where you throw stones at the devil. The Jamarat also existed there in Petra. The Zamzam well in Mecca, that Zamzam well also existed prior to that in Petra. And most people are now saying the Prusul of Siloam in Jerusalem is where the original Zamzam well is. And then the black stone. Ooh, 
What in the world is that black stone doing there in Mecca? Black stone on the corner, the eastern corner of the Kaaba, right there, the center of Islam. It is the place that everybody tries to kiss so they can get their sins forgiven, which is as idolatrous as you can get. The black stone did not exist in Mecca first. It first existed in Petra. Ibn Zubair is the one that took the black stone in the 780s, and he brought it down, looks like, to Mecca. More on that later. So, conclusions concerning Mecca's geographical problems. Well, all we could not find um, any map showing Mecca early in the 7th century. Uh, Gibson's introduced the Kiblis all facing Petra up until 706. Crone debunked the land-based trade route in Mecca. Uh, and then we debunked the sea-based trade routes just this year. Gibson noted that all five stages of the Hajj could be found in Petra, and I would say even earlier than that in Jerusalem. So, though Mecca has existed in Adam and Eve, according to chapter 7, verse 24, there is no evidence of it anywhere until 741. And everything we now find in Mecca, we could briefly find in Petra. And now in Jerusalem, that's the new stuff that's just coming on down the pike. You can hear more about that as we go. So let's debunk the claims about for Mecca. There are many claims. There are actually three main ones. One is Agatha Argides in the second century, according to... Muslims, this is where Mecca was. Why? Because Agatha Argides, writing in the second century, this Greek author, refers to the temple for all Arabs. He located the temple 90 kilometers from the Tiran Island, which is at the entrance of the Gulf of Aqaba. There's the Tiran Island, there's the Gulf of Aqaba. So what's 90 kilometers away? Well, 90 kilometers away is Wadi Ainuna. There it is, and it's still there today. That's the location that Agatha Argides is talking to. But Wadi Ainuna, hold on, folks. How far is that away from Mecca? Let's take a look. When you look on the map, you'll see that Wadi Ainuna is 960 kilometers from Mecca. That's 600 miles further north. Thus, it could not be the Kaaba in Mecca that Argath Argadis is talking about in the 2nd century BC. Well, what about his claim that this was highly revered by all Arabs? Muslims say, see, that must prove that that means Mecca because only all Arabs would go to Mecca. Hold on. What do we mean by the word Arabs? When he was writing in the 2nd century BC, Arabs including all the Romans who can consider or Arabs are from Arabia. So where was Arabia when Agatha Argides was writing? And also all the way up until 125 AD, Arabia was where you see <coughs> that red, red, red rectangular is. That's just really in Jordan and parts of Israel and parts of Syria. That's what it is today. That is called Arabia Petraea. There was nothing outside of that colored area because there was nothing worthy outside of that colored area. Thus, Agatha Argides' temple for the Arabs was Wadi Ainuna and not Mecca. Why? Because it's within that rectangle. It would have been right exactly where all the Arabs would have gone to, the Arabs who were living in his day. Now, what about Pliny the Elder's Dabag in 79 AD? Pliny the, Pliny the Elder was quoting a, Mar a Mauritanian scholar, um, who was who wrote about the Arabian Peninsula? One of the places, and Juba is his name, and one of the places Juba's description is the reference to Dabanagiris Regio. In 1970, Hermann von Wisman, a geographer, proposed that this was the territory belonging to the Quraysh, as well as Mecca and its environs. But Pliny, citing Juba II, refers to the Arabian coast below Kharax, down the Persian Gulf, around Oman, dropping the name Dabanagiris Regio along the way. Thus, Damanagiris Rijo cannot be Mecca, as it is on the east coast of Arabia and not the western coast. What about Ptolemy's Makarabah? This is actually the best one so far that I think that they have come up with, but let's debunk it really quickly. Claudius Ptolemy, writer and geographer from Alexandria in Egypt, who wrote the Guide to a Geography in which he designated many of the cities in Arabia. In 1482, Lionheart Holy drew the map of where he thought Ptolemy's cities were located in the Arabian Peninsula. There's the map where you can see right there. And he gave the coordinates for Makaraba 73 degrees, 20 degrees by 22 degrees, and that's where you place it. There you can see it on the map. This puts it southeast of Yathrib. That's odd because Mecca is paced southwest of Yathrib. So it's too far to the east. Why do people think Makaraba is the reference to Mecca? It's not even the same word. Dan Gibson comes to a solution. He wants... Gam Dan Gibson matched the towns and cities with the rivers, which still exist today, and overlaid them on a map up the left. Fortunately, this put some of the cities into the Arabian Sea, which would not be exactly healthy for the inhabitants who live there. So he then matched Ptolemy's locations to rivers and using mountains and rivers on a map, as you see on the left. 
By doing so, he's found that Ptolemy had not really been in Arabia, and he was not aware of the vastness of the desert between the north and the south in the Arabs, Arabia's interior, with the result that he had plotted the locations in Yemen way too far north. By shrinking Ptolemy's map southward to accommodate the desert, Gibson found that many of his locations suddenly fit. They're now out of the water. They're actually on land where they should be. And they're almost all, all down in what is today Yemen and Oman, which would have been the Hagamat then. So Makaraga becomes present-day Al-Mahabisha. Makaraba was not only an interior settlement of Arabia, but it turned out to be only a small hamlet situated in the Hagamat area of Arabia, what is today Yemen, proving it was not Mecca at all. So... I see I've almost run out of time, so let's go ahead and put it all together. First of all, is there a conflict between Petra and Iraq? I know some of you are going to ask that. Are we getting two conflicting scenarios, Iraq and Jordan, or are they complementary? I would say that Iraq concerns politics, the Quran, and the theological debates, which come much later. Petra and Jerusalem concern really only the Qiblas, the direction of prayer, and the mosque, and also many of the five stages of the, of the, of the Hajj. Iraq both precedes Petra and returns following Petra. Iraq is important between 577 to 638, the quest for Muhammad. Petra is more important for 626 to 727, the Qiblas. And then Iraq then becomes important again after 736 with the Qurans and the Qiblas and everything else that comes then after that. So let's look at Petra versus Mecca, the one preceding the other. The need for a place. Petra has all the stations of the pilgrimage. We talked about the Kaaba. We talked about Marwa and Safa. We talked about the, the washing, the Zamzam well. We talked about the plains of Mustafla and the Jamara platform. So we don't need to repeat that. Notice where Petra is. It is the ancient sanctuary city of tombs and temples. It is on the trade route, east, west, and north. Notice, not south. Mecca is not on any of the international trade routes, not even on the sea route because of the Red Sea, you can see where the green arrows are going. Petra is where the Nabataean Aramaic was spoken and written, which later gave birth to the Quranic Arabic. Petra is also where the mosques up until 706 are facing, the Qiblas, that is, even as far away as Canton in China and Sherman in India. Conclusion, Petra seems to have been the original sanctuary and later copied by Mecca, and I would say Jerusalem even precedes it. Petra is much further north to support the later traditions once again. Now let's look at the 7th century scenario and let's try to put it together. In the 7th century, there were three major empires, the Byzantines and the Sassanids, on the green and the orange. In 622, however, the Byzantine Empire conquered the Sassanids and the small city-states then filled the vacuum left behind. That's where the yellow arrows are. Ironically, we have no historical references for any Muslim caliphate at all from 622 to 661, not in the coins or the documents or the rock inscriptions. Now, in 661, as it comes in, is the first of the Umayyad Kiddush. So that's where we history, the history of what we would think would be Islam comes to begin. The Umayyad Caliphate. We would think they would be Muslims, but they're not. If he was a Muslim, as traditions claim, then why was his capital not in the Hejaz, not way down in Mecca Medina, or in Med and where the traditions state that four, the, all the four previous caliphs lived and reigned? The Umayyad sanctuary, according to the Qiblas, was Petra, not Mecca. So that also confronts the standard Islamic narrative. Note how little land the Umayyads at first controlled, not much more than the Romans before them. So how then did Mecca become important? It's nowhere near there. That's 600 miles further south. To answer that, we need to move to 30 years later to the Caliph of the Malik and his governor, Ibn Zubair. So let's go to Ibn Zubair. Why is he important? Who is he and why is he important? Ibn Zubair was the governor of Petra under Abdul Malik from 685 to 705. Zubair rebelled in 686 against the Umayyad power in Damascus. Obviously, they're not in Medina and Mecca. We wonder why. He destroys the Kaaba in Petra and then takes the Black Stone. Remember that I said I'd come back to the Black Stone. The Black Stone is where God's presence is. So when he takes the Black Stone and from Petra and flees down to the south, perhaps to Mecca, he takes God's presence with him. The Abbasids were very interested in that black stone. They are also interested in coming and being an ally <clears throat> with Zubair, who needs an ally. They're way up in Kira. That's in today's Kufa. That's in Iraq. So they joined the rebellion and they support Zubair due to their hatred of the Umayyads. Now, there's the map there. Take a look at that. In 680, Ibn Marwan supplants the Sufyani family in Damascus. That's the red area. His son Abdul Malik becomes caliph in 685, also in Damascus. In 686, Zubair, Governor Petra, rebels against uh, the, the, uh, the Malik, destroys much of Petra, takes the Black Stone, and he flees the south. That, that's the yellow arrow. Possibly to the Hejaz, where you see Mecca, the dark blue area. He needs allies, and so looks towards the Abbasids, 
who are headquartered in Hira, which is today Kufa, note that the political capitals for Umayyads is Damascus and for the Abbasids is Hira. The sanctuary for the Umayyads is Petra and the sanctuary for the Abbasids is, then becomes Mecca. Two political capitals, two sanctuaries. As the Abbasids become more powerful, Mecca becomes more important. Why? Because they have the black stone and the Abbasids are being, taking more political power. So why is this important? Well, the Arabs had been in power since the mid seventh century, but they had no religious identity. Abdul Malik ruled in Damascus from 685 to 705. The Umayyads had now been controlled since 661. And after 30 years, unlike their cousins through Abraham, the Christians and Jews, they had no prophetic line and they had no scripture. For 30 years, they had been dependent on the Jews and Christians to run their cities. They called them Maulas or Mawalis. There was a jealousy of the Jews and Christians because they had their own prophetic line and they had their own revelations, giving them an identity, which the Arabs did not have. This desire for an Arab identity was then created and introduced by Abdul Malik. Now, let's see how he does it. Well, the first thing he does as the great Arab reformer, he builds the Dome of the Rock in 691. Look and see where it's situated. It's higher than the Christian church on the Holy Sepulchre, sitting right on where the Jews considered the temple to have been, the Holy of Holies to have been. The Al-Aqsa Mosque was not built to 709. So don't confuse it. That's not the mosque we're talking about. Now, the significance of the Dome of the Rock, it's situated uh, right there, smack dab at the, the sanctuary for the Christians and the Jews. It employs Byzantine architecture, but it's much larger. It sits above the Church of the Sepulchre. It's situated above the Holy, situated on the holiest city for Jews. That is where the temple was. That is where the Holy of Holies used to be. That's why it's not in Damascus or nor in Mecca. It's in Jerusalem. Muslims say that it's because of the Miraj, that's why it was built. No, no, no. Look at the inscriptions. They say nothing about the Miraj, nothing about the seven, uh, the, going up the seven heavens or getting the 50 prayers down to five. And why? Because you need to look at the only original part of the building. You need to look at those two inner ambulatories. When you look at the ambulatories, you'll see the Arabic there. When you look at the Arabic, just take a look. I don't have time to go in. I'm running out of time. But notice everything you see on the screen there is against Jesus, against his divinity, against the Trinity, against his sonship. It's all against Jesus, against Jesus of the Byzantine Christian. It's against the monophysites. It's against his divinity. That's why the inner ambulatory, it was written, it was created by other monarchs to attack the Trinitarian form of Jesus, the Trinitarian God named Jesus Christ. The key for protocols. Yehuda Neville talks about this in uh, Crossroads to Islam. During the Sufyani period, you can look at the protocols. They, they do not mention Islam or Muslim or Muhammad or the Quran, which they should be full of because that should be Islamic, right? Up until 680. Then the Marwanids come to power, and then Abdul Malik comes in 685, and then he is the first one to change the protocols. It happens overnight in 691. That's the time the Dome of the Rock is built. So the Bismillah and Muhammad are introduced overnight along with the Shahada. Now, what else do we know? Well, Abdul Malik, the great reformer, he then introduced the coins. The Byzantine coins, there you can see them. Those are normal coins. But then... You have the Sufyani Diham, and you notice those coins still have crosses on them. That means they're Christians from 681, 681 up until the 680s. Abdul Malik then comes in 685, and then in 692, and in 693, he introduces this coin with his image on it, and the Shahada is introduced at the same time, the Dome of the Rock, he introduces the Shahada on the coins. And then in 696, he introduces attack after attack after attack on the coins against Christian Byzantine. Byzantine Christianity against the divinity of Jesus, the Trinity, and his sonship. So, Abdul Malik introduces here an Arab identity in the guise of an Arab prophet. Beginning with the Dome of the Rock, it's larger than any other structure. It's facing the Arab sanctuary, Petra. It incorporates inscriptions which, uh, it, which are, are against Byzantine Christianity. It introduces Islam. It induces the people, Muslims, and it induces the prophet Muhammad. The Cadeful Protocols. Overnight, in 690, we do exactly the same thing. So do the coins. They re he replaces his image with induces Muhammad, introduces the Shahada on the coins, just like he did on the Dome of the Rock and on the protocols. Now, once they have the man, they now need a book. So that's when the book starts to get formed. That's why the earliest texts are found on the Dome of the Rock. They are not the same as what we find on the text that we have today. The earliest chronic manuscripts start to appear in 705. The, that's about the time of his son. They are not complete. They are not parallel with today's Quran. They have been changed and corrected throughout through, and they don't get canonized until really until 1924, 97 years ago. Now that we have, according to Brubaker's material, there are over 4,000 corrections all the way along. And now we have... 30 of these kiddos to start to introduce in the 8th century. 
So now they have the Book of the Man, but they haven't really finished the year of the Book of the Man. They needed a place. The Umayyads, sanctuaries, and Petra were destroyed by the earthquake in 713. New places needed. Mecca, first noted in 727. Mecca was possibly chosen by the rebel Abdul Mazubair, and then he, uh, he uh, then allies himself with the Abbasids. So the Abbasids and Zubair, with their sanctuary in Mecca, they demand allegiance to the surrounding tribe. Now they have the Black Stone, they now want to choose Mecca as a place in contradistinction to Petra. And that's why they build the five stages of the Hajj. The five stages of the Hajj are all paralleling the ones way up in Petra. Now we can see why there are four Qiblas. Why four Qiblas? Well, the earliest Qiblas were all facing Petra because they were the Umayyad Qiblas. All those facing Mecca are those from the Abbasids. Al-Hajjaj, who rebels in 706, he starts the in-between Qiblas, and he's now in rebelling against the Umayyads. Those in North Africa and the Andalusia, they're also in rebellion, so therefore they're not going to face either Petra or Mecca. They want to see who's going to win out. Either the Umayyads or the Abbasids, there, there's a tussle going on between these two empires, and so politically speaking, they want to make sure that they're hedging their bets, so they wait to see who's going to win. And there, of course, by 749, the Abbasids win. So that's why all the Qiblas start to face Mecca from 749 on. But that is not complete until 822. So here's the scenario. What if? September 2021. By the time the Abbasids are in pound 749, they now have a prophet, they now have a revelation, they now have a sanctuary, Mecca. They still need a history, however, to give authority to their prophet. That's why it takes another 70 years for them to finally write the Siddha, his biography, and another, uh, another over another 110 years to write the first of what we know as the Hadith. And then it takes it almost 200 years for them to write the Tafsir down. So it takes them all that time. Why? Because it takes a while to get, uh, get rid of all this other history and replace it with their own narrative. So by the 9th and 10th century, they now have the book, the man, the place, and the story. And a new religion is formed and growing. Yet not within 22 years, as the standard Islamic narrative tells us, but it evolved over two to 300 years, folks. Let's go and let's conclude. Five areas we've investigated. What the claims they make, the historical problems, the geographical problems, the historical claims debunked, and then also Mecca's history put together. Let's look at our final conclusions, and here they are. Our, my remit was really to investigate the history of Mecca in the 7th century. It is obvious that everything Muslims are dependent on for their book, man, and place are based on the standard Islamic narrative, which are two to 300 years too late and hundreds of miles too far north, too late and too far away. These narratives, these Islamic traditions, describe Mecca as a fertile place and the oldest habitation for humans on earth. The standard Islamic narrative tells us that Mecca is the city of Adam and Eve, Seth, Ishmael, Mo, Noah, Hud, Saleh, Abraham, and up to 30 to 70 different prophets. They all were buried there. Even the Arabic, which should have been in Mecca, the Sabaic, is nowhere near it, but derived from Nabataean Aramaic, situated 600 miles further north. It was the revisionists in Europe who were the first to sound the alarm with the standard Islamic narrative, starting in the 9th century. We are now taking it and moving it from there. Geographically speaking, Mecca has huge problems. None of the maps up to 980 show Mecca on them. All of the 7th century and some of the 8th century Qiblas were facing Petra, not Mecca. Patricia Crone debunked Watts' land-based trade route theory back in 1987. We shut down the sea-based trade route theory of the Red Sea, proving it was via Africa, not via Arabia at all. The five stages of the Hajj in Mecca were all bad copies of those er already in Petra. And I would say even earlier in Jerusalem, every Muslim claim for an early Mecca can be debunked by simply using historical maps. When we look at the 7th and 8th century, we see that Islam grew out of a political conflict between two succeeding empires and the need for a strong Arab identity. The Arabs needed a book, a man, and a place in order to have their own identity, all of which attained by created the Quran, Muhammad, and finally Mecca. So, in conclusion, everything I've just shown you about Mecca, we can pretty well debunk historically. We can be debunked just by looking at the maps, looking at the coins, looking at the inscriptions, and looking at the place and just looking from down onto Mecca itself. It's in a desert, folks. There's no civilization there for a very good reason. There's no water. There's no water. There's no vegetation. If there's no vegetation, there are no people. If there are no people, there are no towns. There are no towns, there are no cities. If there's no cities, there's no civilization. If there's no civilization, there's no trade, and there is no history. That's why Mecca just makes no sense. Take it to the Muslims now and see how they answer it. And every time they want to start talking about Mecca, just say, oh, oh, hold on. Prove it.
but not from the 9th and 10th century anymore. Too distant and too far north from the 7th century. Tell me from the 7th century where this city is. And if you can't find Mecca, you can't find Muhammad. If you can't find Muhammad, you can't find the Quran. Bingo, you've just thrown out all three in one fell swoop. Great to be with you. I'm sure you have lots of questions. This is Jay then, over and out.